Welcome to Playwright to Playwright, an online interview series presented by Queen's Theatre. You are listening to the audio description pre-show notes for the interview. Because the format is fairly simple and the talking is continuous, there will be no audio description during the interview itself. The video begins with a title screen. The Queen's Theatre logo fills up the left side of the screen. The logo resembles the letter Q. The circle of the letter Q is orange and the rectangular tail is black. The text of the title screen reads, Playwright to Playwright, with Rob Urbanati and special guest Corey Thomas. Originally recorded June 6, 2020. Technical production, Jay Rogers. Boca video effect by vidiz.com. The Queen's Theater at Home text logo is in the lower right-hand corner of the frame. The interview consists of close-ups of Corey and Rob in large squares filling a split screen, with Rob on the left and Corey on the right. At times, when Corey is speaking, a close-up of her fills the screen with Rob in a small square in the upper right-hand corner. Throughout most of the interview, the phrase, Playwright to Playwright, one-on-one with Corey Thomas, appears horizontally in black on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, and the phrase, Queen's Theatre at Home, appears horizontally on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. The word Queen's is in orange, and the word Theatre is in black. Rob is in his 60s, with close-cropped dark hair and a round face. Corey is in her 40s, with long, straight brown hair and full lips. Both are in their living rooms, visible from the shoulders up, and are wearing black sweaters. Corey is using white earbuds. Hi, I'm Rob Urbanati, Director of New Play Development at Queen's Theatre, and today I'll be interviewing Corey Thomas, playwright and activist, as part of our Playwright to Playwright series. Hi, Corey. Hi. Where does this find you? I am presently sheltering in place in Oakland, California. I've been here since March, beginning of March. You're based in New York City, though, correct? I am. I am a born and bred New Yorker. When will you be coming back? Uh, Hopefully the end of June, it's looking like. Excellent. Not 100% set, but that's the plan. I thought it would be good today to start with... I'm really eager to hear your thoughts about what's going on in America now. Well, that is a long answer, (laughs) so I'm going to try to condense it. But I think it's important. I think it's necessary. I think it's um, an urgent uh, situation that required being addressed. So the uprisings, the protests are scary, exciting, um, and... I feel like they're having some effect. I mean, the fact that it's all over America, but it's also all over the world now. Um, The world is sort of joined in on these protests. So I think that that's that's hopeful. That gives me some hope that that things have a little chance of changing. I mean, I think that everyone has gotten to the point where it's just we can't take it anymore. So there's there's hope that maybe the the people in charge understand that, or, you know, they may be pushing against it, but I think they understand that. A lot of your plays have dealt with themes of social injustice. I'm thinking most specifically now about the most recent play I saw of yours, Lockdown, which was a rattlestick. Can you talk about your instinct or your um, drive as a playwright to address social issues in theater? I don't think it started out as a conscious thought of mine, and it never has been really conscious. I think that it might stem from the fact that as a child growing up, I felt a little odd always. My parents, I had, my parents were of two different races from two different continents. They spoke different languages. So I think I always felt a little bit odd bird compared to everyone else who was just one thing. And so I think think that my plays have always been me trying to locate or identify with some marginalized type situation or person and then trying to normalize that person so that there's something not odd about it anymore. If you get to know something or someone, I think it it breaks down some of those walls that separate and make an other the other. So I think I told someone once, I think I try to unother the other in my place. So I think that's where the urge comes from, though. I see. And it's a fascinating way to look at it. Um, 
still on the subject of lockdown, I was really intrigued by the play itself, but also the approach to the post-show discussions. The play dealt with long-term long-term prisoners or people that have been incarcerated for life. And can you talk a bit about the idea behind the post-show discussions? Yeah, that was solely Daniela Topol's idea at Rattlestick um, to have what she called community conversations. The funny thing is, is I was very, very sort of resistant to the idea at first mm. when she said, I want to have a talk back after every single show. I mean, we had a talk back even after opening night. She insisted on doing that. And I said, you know, I'm very afraid of my play becoming like sort of a teaching point. And I didn't write it that way. It's a play. Um, and so that was my initial response to the to the plan to do that. But then. I mean, those conversations ended up being, you know, like the most, most part of the most exciting part of the, the mm. evening or the show itself. So, you know, the convert, I went to pretty much every performance, which I don't think I've ever done with any play of mine, you know, where I go to every single performance. And it was because I wanted to see what was going to happen at the conversation, because there were some dramatic things that happened during the conversation. So there's been this um, urge in me to continue doing the play. I'd love to do it all around the country because I think it addresses, you know, this whole theme of police and especially black men um, on different from a different point of view even. And um, and then have these conversations because they just seem to be so healing and it seemed the play seemed to be a way to jumpstart certain difficult conversations. Yeah, it's interesting how, you know, timely that play is right now. It was timely when I saw it a few months ago, and it's arguably more timely now. I do think, or I felt, Corey, that they were very separate experiences. Like, I loved the play and was enthralled by it, and it was intense. And then the post-show discussion was completely involving and, and completely intense in a very different way. So um, congratulations to you and Daniela for... Um, pulling that off. Yeah, no, I think I, I agree with you. I think that in a way it was important for the play because it felt like it made it a safe space to have the conversation. But yes, the conversation was its own thing. And, you know, it was really, yeah, it was very interesting how that worked out. I think part of it was that the conversations really didn't have a whole lot to do with your regular um, talk back. It wasn't about the play. How did you write the play? I mean, I think yeah. I joined in on one conversation, actually. So I was usually not even a part of the conversation. There were individuals who had lived experience in some way or another who then had a conversation with the audience and discussed issues that were brought up in the play. But it wasn't really about the play. I don't think the actors ever took part in a talk back. So it really was more of a sort of a let's now have a community conversation about the subject matter. It was really yeah. interesting. Yeah, it was beautiful. You um, have had a long history with Daniela Topol, and yeah. one of the plays of yours that I loved so much was um, when it was at Ensemble Studio Theater, When January Feels Like Summer, which Daniela directed. I believe it was the first play I saw with a transgender character. Can you talk about um, the genesis of that play? <laughs> yeah, that play arose. It was, it was, I think it was two different things that sort of morphed into that play. The first thing that happened was I had been on a subway. Um, there were two African-American men, young men, black men sitting across from me, and they were having this conversation about a woman. And it was a really irreverent offensive conversation. They were using foul language to dis to describe her and talking amongst themselves. And I sat across from them and I was offended and I was disgusted. And I went to put my iPod earphones in and I didn't have it with me. So I was like, oh darn, now I have to just sit here and listen to these guys. And as I listened to them, the most unusual thing happened. I realized this is a friend of theirs and they actually care about her. And it's just that the words they're using are sort of negative words. And my entire opinion of them changed as I listened to them. And I ended up feeling guilty and bad 
about myself that I'd wanted to block them off and that I hadn't given them the chance first to to give them the opportunity to listen to them and to see who they were and what they were actually speaking about and making coming to to sort of a quick judgment about them and their character. And so that experience just became something that I kept going over and over in my mind. And I realized how I think that happens so much in life that we meet someone and we make an immediate decision about who they are. We judge them, we decide things about people. And I think I decided I wanted to write a play about that. Now, at the same time, I saw a documentary on PBS about a transgender uh, person. It was a male to female. Um, in some little Midwest town, this person had undergone, had the, had the uh, surgery and was a construction worker and now was trying to continue their lives after having been known, you know, first as a man and now as a woman and trying to continue the job and was completely ostracized and had divorced from her wife, but now had to live in the basement because nobody would rent an apartment to her or anything. And there was just something that felt so heroic about this, this woman that I just, I, you know, something about that and how, you know, you might have seen her when she was a he and you wouldn't have known the turmoil that was going on inside and if you now saw him as her you wouldn't know that you know th so I think the, somehow the two things just morphed into this play and I think I said it the the transgender is an Indian uh, from you know a, a brother and sister and the brother is transitioning to female um, and I think it's because as a child I had I was a mother's helper in an Indian household, my brother's best friend's house. And so I sort of just, you know, felt very much a part of that, that uh, environment and that the foods and the people and the language and all of that. So I think that's why I placed it there. And I thought it might be also just an interesting, I love to have international sort of aspects to my characters. That's another thing I frequently do because I think I come from this sort of, you know, I'm a first generation American, so I'm a child of immigrants. So I think that that's part of my instinct also. And it's not something I think about, but I think I just do it naturally. Yeah, it's a beautiful play and you've just made the most cogent argument for the validity of leaving your earbuds at home um, as an opportunity to you know, access other people's lives. There's, there's a deep strain of humanity, deeply felt humanity that runs through all of your plays um, that I look forward to when I go see new work of yours. This um, introducing of character, meaning um, deciding to have a transgender character in a play that was written a while ago, also seemed to inform the play that you, we've done two readings of at Queen's Theatre, My Secret Language of Wishes, yes. which apart from classics like Miracle Worker and Elephant Man, was the first play I had read, the first contemporary play that featured a disabled character. Can you talk about that play a bit? Yeah. Again, you know, I, it's so funny. My my urges, I've never thought of myself as a political writer on any level. I mean, I think I thought I wasn't one, you know. But mm. I, again, I think I always just write by something that stirs me. That play came out of a subway. It's another subway play, sort of. I was, I was at, uh, I arrived in Times Square that was getting off the train, and I saw in front of me this, a uh, young black girl who was very, very, um, you know, unable to walk easily. She was disabled, and there was a young white uh, woman, girl, that didn't seem far in age from her, with her. And I was thinking, like, wow, the first thing I thought was, wow, she, how is she going to manage getting up the stairs? She wasn't in a wheelchair, and she was having, you know, she wasn't walking easily. And then the young girl that was with her didn't seem much older. She seemed to be sort of in an aid position with her. So there were a few things that just struck me. First, I thought, well, maybe this is a group outing of some sort. And I looked, nobody else was around. And then I said, this is so interesting. Usually you see the aid person 
is usually the black person and the person who needs the aid is the white person. So there was something, there was a juxtaposition there that struck me. I, I just know that there was something about them that intrigued me to such a level that I actually started following them. And then I said, you're crazy. Don't follow people. And I turned and went about my business, but they just stayed with me and stayed with me. And somehow my imagination or mind or brain or whatever started making up a story for who they were and where they were going. And that's really where the play came from. So it wasn't, I don't think that I wanted to explore disability or any of that. It was that the two people had somehow struck me. But I think it's that same urge to, you know, how we look at people and there's something different. And so I think I just always want to get inside of that and not make it be different anymore. So, um, yeah, so that's where that play came from. But I did do a lot of research. I mean, what I do is when I start writing these plays, I do do a lot of research about whatever the subject matter is because I always want to try to be accurate, respectful, and, um, you know, and, and write, you know, I'm not usually writing inside out plays because if I haven't had the lived experience, who am I to say what something actually is? But I would like to sort of to have a character that and give them some dignity in the world because I think I end up seeing them. I become very close to my characters, you know, so they become like family members or something. So I try to dignify them with the work. So I try to be as authentic and accurate as possible. So, you know, when I, when I decided what uh, illnesses this character had, I made sure to speak to people and get medical um, attention. The very first production was in Minneapolis, and we had a young uh, girl who has cerebral palsy who sat in on all the rehearsals and, you know, that sort of thing. I remember being deeply moved by the play so much that after we did the first reading at Queen's Theatre, um, if I remember this right, because it was a while ago, you and I discussed it, and in addition to the disabled character, there's a gay relationship, there's issues yes. of class, there's issues yeah. of race. There's issues of privilege, and yeah. I believe that you wanted to refine those or explore the mm -hmm. chemistry yeah. of those a bit more carefully. So about five years after the first reading, we did another reading of it. Can you talk a bit about your experience at Queen's Theatre and what those readings were like? Yeah, I mean, I'll talk about the very first one is one that has stayed with me my whole life and career at this point, and I'll explain why. And every class I ever give, because I do a lot of guest teaching, and I've even actually taught some semesters as an adjunct here and there, but I always, always talk about that Queen's Theater in the Park reading, and I'll tell you why. I mean, first of all, it was one of my first readings, so that was exciting. I had this amazing cast, two of whom have gone on to, you know, become really touted uh, actresses. Um, Marin Ireland, Vanessa Aspiaga were in that cast, so that was mm -hmm. cool. I mean, back in those days, we were just this group of young artists trying to find the theater, first of all. <laughs> I think we all yes. gathered on that train, and we felt like we were walking to the ends of the earth, you know? Like, so we were all walking through that park. I saw Marin recently, and she was like, I remember walking through the, <laughs> to that theater so it's a it stayed with us but then um i remember you having told me ahead of time that the reading was sold out and i was like really <laughs> you know, i've never heard of such a thing a reading being sold out and then the next thing that happened was when the reading was about to start and we're sitting in the audience and you know the actors are there i sat there and i looked at the demographics of the audience and it was primarily a white audience, maybe an all-white audience, if I recall, and many of them seemed to be like maybe, you know, middle-aged or, you know, they weren't particularly young. They were, and I think you had, when you had told me that a lot of them were retired neighborhood people who come to the theater, and so I was thinking this play has nothing to do with the lives of these people. They're going to hate this play. They're going to hate me. I sat in the back thinking I was going to be stoned or people would leave. or That was my, my instinctual expectation of what was going to happen. And the opposite happened. It was so interesting. 
I mean, they gave the play a standing ovation. I've never seen a standing ovation at a reading either in my life. And then we had a talk back and I've never been so moved as I was where the audience members were talking about the characters and using their first names as if they were people that they knew, you know, and it just changed me forever because what I realized was that these are the people I'm writing my plays for, just regular people. You know, I think beforehand I'd been thinking like you write for your theater people and, you know, whatever, people who are more like you. And I said, and I just felt so moved by the fact that uh, an audience that were not at all, that did not look like the characters in the play, were able to totally accept the characters in the play and see them as people. So that just, it, it's always meant something to me. That's so beautiful. It's really touching to me. I'm pleased to tell you that the demographics of our audience have evolved over the years since we did <laughs> the but we still do have that core of what you're referring to. I call them civilians mm -hmm. right. regulars, who, yeah, unlike readings at most theaters, they're mm -hmm. not theater insiders. They're just folks. And it can mm -hmm. really give playwrights an opportunity to hear their play in front of a general audience and hear comments yeah. from them. So you had alluded to your um, parents earlier in this conversation. And I remember for a project that we were considering at Queens Theater, you had submitted a a short version of what later became a full-length play, Pa's Hat. And so I know a bit about your um, parents, particularly your father, um, but I'd love to hear you talk more about them. Okay. Yeah, my dad was born in Liberia, West Africa, and he was a diplomat. Um, he was a diplomat until 1980 when there was a coup d'etat and they overthrew the government, a military government. But at the time he was he was working in New York City. So eventually, um, you know, the Civil War began in Liberia. It was a long, long standing war. Um, they, my, my uncle was killed. Many people we knew were killed. Mm -hmm. And my dad, obviously the government that he had been representing no longer existed. So he lost his job, but he was also in danger of losing his life because they they called for him to come back and stand trial, which really meant be killed. And so he uh, stayed in the U.S. and he applied for political asylum, but he then became uh, named an enemy of the country. He was put on a list, you know, that, that if he were to return, he would, be, um, he would be arrested immediately. And so what happened is 20 years later, this was 1980, this happened 20 years later, um, I went to Liberia with my dad, who was now 83. The war was still going, but it had morphed into something else. And while there with him, I actually <laughs> had a moment where a, a machine gun was pointed to my head by a furious, furious child soldier. And, you know, it was a moment where I thought for sure I was about to die. Um, and it, it, it really, you know, was sort of an aha moment for me because obviously I didn't die, but I think it made me become a very um, deliberate person in terms of doing what I set out to do. I think before that I'd been sort of, you know, aimlessly, I'm going to do this someday, I'm going to do this someday, and it made me actually sort of do what I say I'm going to do. Um, I think I realized life is short, so you should try to seize every moment as you can. And I think it just made me want to do things that matter for some reason. Um, so, you know, I started a nonprofit that helps former child soldiers get an education in Liberia. To this day it goes. I've put a lot of young men through school. And um, I also, uh, you know, help people with job, job things. I helped a bunch of women who are rock stone blasters. They actually blast stones for gravel. I got them wheelbarrows, you know, th that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but Paz Hat uh, was eventually produced, a full-length play in Minneapolis also, and it is now the first of a trilogy of plays that explore the history of Liberia and my family's history to that play. My mom was Brazilian, 
Um, she was a Brazilian uh, lawyer, but she didn't really practice law after she married my dad because then, as I said, he was a diplomat, so we lived in different countries where he was posted. Um, and so, you know, that was my mom. I haven't really explored the Brazilian side of my family yet, and I have to do that one of these days. <laughs> so. Well, maybe now that you are, and I wanted to announce for anybody that hadn't heard, um, officially you're one of the few people to get hired in the midst of a pandemic, and you're the inaugural WP Theater Mellon Foundation Playwright in Residence. So congratulations, Corey. Thank you. Super Thank happy you. For you. They made Very the right excited. choice. Yeah. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, well, it's a three-year position, which is really exciting because most things are like one year or a month or whatever. So this way I have three years to to have a, a theatrical home, basically, and write something and be a part of the company. I become an employee, basically, of the company. And so, um, you know, I will be involved in all of the, all of the undertakings that the company does. Uh, undergoes at that point we're gonna you know I'll be involved in in staff meetings and um, whatever whatever the theater is doing I will be a part of that um, I think it's a it's a program to groom people to become possible future leaders of theater um, so it gives you the opportunity the Mellon Foundation gives people the opportunity to be in residence and aside from exploring their own work and having a place to explore their own work to also have access to how a theater works so that um, they can perhaps influence and help to, you know, to enhance the theater and bring it into and uh, lift it up on some level, I guess. So I'm really excited. I think it's going to be fun. It's a cool theater, cool people running it. I've loved their productions over the years. Mm -hmm. And it's, you seem a perfect choice for a variety of reasons. One is just the quality of your writing, plain and simple, but also your, uh, your empathy, your keen awareness of social injustice, and your eagerness to take those issues on. Um, your, as you, you alluded to earlier, the Paz Hat Foundation, so you're um, looking to do good work for people. So, Corey, I, I want to congratulate you on that position. I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with me today um, and for sharing your experiences about Queen's mm -hmm. Theater. We're yes. glad you didn't get lost in the park. Some people have been <laughs> permanently. We've never found it. Um, I'm excited that you're coming back to New York, and I'm looking forward to new work from you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so thank much. You, Corey. And yes. take care, and let's be in touch when you're back in the city. Absolutely. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.